Thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. I love that song. Aren't you glad that God loves you, loves you and has made redemption possible? The word redeem means to purchase back. Jesus paid the price for us so that we could be redeemed and have a right relationship with God. That's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, today we begin this new series called Surviving the Storms of Life. Next week, I'm going to talk about uh, letting God speak to you in a storm. You do not want to miss it. If you can only be here one service between this week and next week, come next week. All right, so, uh, but no, seriously, you, you uh, need to bring somebody with you. It's going to be very, very helpful. Today, I'm going to talk about where is God in the storm? Now, we all face storms, and I realize that's a metaphor for the difficulties of life, but can't much of life be characterized by storms? Uh, last year, in fact, um, I went through not a metaphorical storm, but a literal storm. I was sitting in my living room, sitting on my couch. I was literally with my computer uh, on my lap working on a sermon, and the storms, the winds were getting high, and I, I began to be a little concerned. And all of a sudden, my, a, a tornado came close to our house, and it blew out our windows in the back of our house. And I'm sitting there, and this glass comes all over my neck, my legs, my arms. I was bleeding and there was a big branch that missed my head about that far, about a foot, and impaled itself in the wall right across from me. It literally was a, when a foot of taking my life. Now, here's what I've believed and known and learned about that. Nothing can take you out if God's not finished with you yet. Aren't you glad for that? I mean, the fact is, I know that God is in control because there I was um, in the path of a tornado, okay? Let me tell you something. Tornado is no match for God. Tornado has a lot of strength, a lot of power, but nothing like the power of God. And, and so it began this thought process in me, and this is where this uh, sermon series has come from. Uh, I believe that all of us need to survive a storm. We need to be prepared to survive in the storm. Well, you're going to face storms. There's no doubt about that. Um, in fact, I heard one guy say that you're either coming out of a storm, in a storm, or going into a storm. And that probably describes life. You're either going into one, you're in one, or you're coming out. Um, and by storms, we are talking about the difficulties, the challenges of life. So I'm going to read to you a passage of Scripture today that most of you are familiar with the story. Uh, I'm not going to read the entire story because it's 42 chapters long. It's an entire book of the Old Testament. It's the book of Job, okay? But I am going to read a few verses. I'm going to kind of highlight some of the things that Job went through so we can learn some things about where is God in the storms in our life? Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. And there were born to him seven sons and three daughters, and he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, that's a lot of camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Now, I'm not going to spend time trying to read the entire book or even an entire chapter. But I'm going to give you, in a nutshell, what happened to Job. Job was serving God. Job was a man of integrity. Job had every reason to expect that life not only was good, but that it would continue to be good. And in one day, Job had his possessions, 
when we say his possessions, we're talking about all of them, not some. He didn't just lose a car. He lost everything. Not only did he lose his possessions, he lost his family. His 10 children died in one storm, one day, one accident. And his own wife turned against him. She said to him, why don't you curse God and die? Then, of course, we know that Job lost his friends because his friends came supposedly to comfort him. And the way they comforted him, they stared at him for a few days to begin with and didn't even say a word. And then when they did talk, they really began accusing him and telling him, you're a bad person, Job. You are getting what you deserve, Job. Can you imagine having friends? Who needs enemies when you've got friends like that? So in one day, Job lost all that. And then in the next day, he lost his health. The Bible says he was covered from head to toe with boils. I don't know if you ever had a boil or not, but that, they're very painful. And uh, it said that he sat in a heap of ashes and he scraped his skin with a broken piece of pottery. That's how much pain Job was in. So get the picture. He was very successful. He had a lot of wealth. He had a lot of success. He was a very respected man. And in one day, he lost his family, not just some of them, all of them. He lost his possessions, not just a little bit, all of his possessions. He lost his friends. He lost his health. Now think about that. I would say that Job knew more about human suffering, about ultimate suffering, than anybody not only that I've ever known, but I've, anyone that I've ever heard of. I've never heard of anyone that lost as much as Job did in a short period of time. And yet, the Bible tells us in the book of Job that Job did not sin with his mouth. He did not accuse God of something that he didn't do. What incredible integrity that Job had. And so, here's the questions, though. Understand that Job did ask God a lot of questions. The interesting thing is that God didn't always answer, okay? Um, God doesn't always answer our questions. He's not a, afraid of you asking questions. He's okay if you ask questions. It's okay to ask questions of God. But just understand that God is sovereign. God is God. God is in control. And he doesn't always give us a satisfactory answer. I've asked God, why did I go through physically what I went through a few years ago? Why? And God never answered me. I did learn that I grew spiritually from it. I did learn that I, I learned to be thankful even in the midst of my storm. And God made me a better husband, a better pastor, and a better Christian for what I went through. And so where is God during the storm? This is a question that Job asked, and there's nothing wrong with asking that question. I really have two points that I want to give you today, and the first answer to that question is God is sovereign in the storm. Now, I know that doesn't really answer where, but it does answer who he is. Where is God in the storm? First of all, you always have to remember, God is sovereign during the storm. You don't have to worry that God is not in control or that he has lost control. God is always, always in control. Now, Job asked two basic questions that people still ask today. He asked two questions of God. The first one was, why do bad things happen? You've probably asked that question before. You've probably asked it this way, why do bad things happen to me? Or maybe you've asked it this way. Why do bad things happen to good people? You ever asked that question? You ever wondered that? The fact is, uh, that's probably the opposite question that we should be asking. Because when we understand how good and how gracious and how powerful God is, and we understand our own sin nature, maybe the better question would be, why does anything good at all? ever happen to us? But Job asked that question. It's a human question. It is a common question. 
Why do bad things happen? You've probably asked that question yourself. And then the second question that Job asked of God was this. Does God really do what he says? God promises that he would never leave me or forsake me. I've heard the preacher say that. I've read that in the Bible. But is that really true? Yeah, now, don't raise your hand. You're in church, okay? But have you ever wondered if God kept his promises? You ever been in something so painful, so horrific, so bad, and you know that God promised to be with you. You know that God promised never to leave you or forsake you, but you ever wonder? You ever think, I wonder if God's really keeping his word? And by the way, if you've ever felt that or thought that, you're not in bad company. King David, the man that wrote most of the Psalms, he asked that question multiple, multiple times. And if a man like David who was faithful, a man like David whom God used not only to be the king of Israel, the ancestor of Jesus, but he also used him to pen Holy Scripture, if a guy like that's going to ask that question, then I don't feel so bad when I ask that question. Does God really keep his word? Does God really show up the way that he promised to show up? Does God always manifest himself when I'm going through a storm? Well, those are two very powerful questions. And the interesting thing, and I encourage you to read the book of Job, um, Toward the end, after Job had asked all these questions and his friends had accused him and uh, they argued back and forth, in the very end, God had his turn to speak. Not that he has to take a turn, but he waited and God said to Job, he challenged Job. In fact, he didn't really answer Job. He just asked Job a lot of questions. You know what he started out with? Were you there when I started, when I created the universe? Were you there? When I created wisdom, and often the problem that God reveals to us is not that we ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. But the thing that I learned from reading about Job was that sometimes we ask the wrong questions. The wrong question may be, why do bad things happen to me? That may be the wrong question. God wants us to look at his promises and understand that he is sovereign. He is in control. He is sovereign in the storm. Uh, Ephesians 1.11 says, Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Now, isn't that a mouthful? I mean, the truth is, God has a plan, and he is going to work things out according to his plan. I realize that we get all nervous, and um, some of you, you're so nervous, you have coffee, cigarettes, and fingernails every morning for breakfast. That's what you're, you're just nervous all the time. You're worried about the economy. You're worried about your job. You're worried about your health. You're worried about the election. You're just worried about everything, and Here's what I take comfort in knowing. God works everything out according to his plan. He is sovereign even in the middle of your storm. Now, God showed Job how to respond to his sovereignty. He showed him that he is to give God control because we can trust him. God's trustworthy. And here's the thing, we've got to learn to release our problems to God. And then he taught Job how to find joy in his current circumstances. Now this is a big one, because if you and I will learn how to do this, we'll be able to find joy somewhere in the way things currently are, not in how we think they ought to be. Now listen, if all you're doing is worrying about how things ought to be, you're not going to be very happy. If all you do is worry about, you know, well, if it ever gets like this, or if I ever get my house paid off, or if I ever get my car paid off, or if my kids ever get out of my hair and get out of school and I have to quit paying for college and all this stuff, if that ever happens, 
if I ever get that second house that I want, if I ever get an extra week of vacation, if I ever move into a neighborhood that's nicer, if I ever get a house that I is my dream house, if I... Have you ever noticed that we put a lot of conditions on our happiness? We put a lot of conditions on our joy? And here's what God taught Job. Learn to be content. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't have goals or that you shouldn't have a desire to get better or to do better or to get a promotion at work or uh, to have retirement. That, that's not what that means. It means that you and I must learn to be content with who God is. And when we do that, we know that we can find contentment and peace and joy somewhere in how things currently are. I had to learn this the hard way. For those of you who have been coming here for at least four, four years, you know that uh, in 2019, 2020, we just had a lot of stuff happen. Uh, you know, COVID-19 hit in 2020. And... Um, I got really sick. I uh, ended up, uh, I wasn't able to be at church for about two months. I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't even get out of bed. I couldn't walk. Lost about 60 pounds. Unfortunately, I've put it back on. But nevertheless, I, I was, I thought I was going to die. I really did. My wife thought I was going to die. And um, I, you know, I, I did what a lot of you would do in that circumstance. I questioned God. God here I was trying my best to serve. I'm, I'm a pastor. I've given my whole life to serving God. And this is what happens. And to be honest, I wasn't very thankful. I wasn't thankful at all, in fact. And here's what the Bible says, and this is a hard thing. It says, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Anybody can give thanks when everything's going good. Anybody can give thanks when you get a promotion at work, when you get a raise, when your kids, you know, are pleasing you, when uh, everything's good at home. Uh, anybody can give thanks then. I mean, it doesn't require anything to thank God for that. But can you thank God in the middle of a storm? Can you thank God in the middle of difficulty? Well, I had to learn that if I was going to get better if I was going to do what Scripture teaches and be thankful and everything, I had to thank God for my pain. There was a time I had such pain that I didn't know if I was going to be able to survive or not. It was pain constantly. And I was just in such terrible, terrible uh, pain all the time. And when I began to trust God, when I began to thank God, I remember the time that I came to that point where I finally said, God, thank you for my illness. Thank you for my sickness. And people in our church and all across the world were praying for me, and we were claiming God's healing, and God has healed me. I'm progressively better. I, I, I still got a little bit of a limp, but I can actually jog a little bit now and get around, and uh, don't tell Kim. She thinks I'm still disabled, and I can't do anything around the house. All right, so, uh, but... The fact is, <laughs> the fact is, uh, when I began to be thankful and to realize that God is in control no matter what, when I began to find joy in how things currently are, not in how I hoped they would be or could be one day, it transformed my attitude and my thought process. And I really want to challenge you to do the same thing. Hebrews 4, 14, so let us cling to him and never stop trusting him. That's the key. You want to be able to survive the storm? You want to be able to be thankful during difficult times? Cling to him. Trust him. And don't ever stop trusting him. Well, this brings me to my second and my last point, that uh, God's sovereign in the storm, but where is God in the storm? Number two, God is present in the storm. You need to understand this. God is present in the storm. Her, Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Aren't you glad that God made that promise to us? He is present with you even during 
difficult times. Well, which brings me to this question. If God is present in the storm, then why do storms happen at all? Why doesn't God just let us have sunny days and mountaintop experiences? Why can't we have more of that? I mean, I don't know about you, but I like that a lot better than the valley and the dark days and the troubled times. But why does God let storms happen? Well, there's a couple reasons. Uh, number one, storms happen primarily because of Adam's sin. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, Romans 5, 12, when Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. And Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. So here's the point. All bad things stem from the sin of Adam. I'm not saying all th bad things stem from your sin. Some people think that God's always angry with them. Now, that's not the case for believers, okay? You have God's favor. You have God's promise. You have God's blessing on your life. Now, can we displease God? Can we refuse to serve God? Sure, okay? But just because you have a flat tire on the way home does not mean that God is judging you, okay? Sometimes you run over a nail and you get a flat tire, you know? Sometimes uh, we think, well, God's judging me. My refrigerator broke down. Well, you know, guess what? Sometimes refrigerators break down in this world, okay? So it's not always a sign of God being angry with you, okay? So, uh, but all problems come as a result of the sin that was introduced into the uh, the world by Adam's sin. This means war and death and disease and poverty and crime and pain. These all happen because of Adam's sin. So whenever you're dealing with somebody and they question why are these bad things happening, it's not because God's angry. It's not because God's mean. It is because of our sin. You say, well, couldn't a just and loving God have kept all these bad things from happening? Sure. Couldn't he have kept us from sinning? Sure. But you would not have been human. You would not have had a free will. You would not have been able to respond to God if he had just uh, made you like a computer. The fact is, the reason, and, and this is hard to get your head around sometimes, the reason that these things can happen is because God loves us so much that he gave us a free will. Because without a free will, you could not experience the love of God. You couldn't know it. You couldn't understand it. Okay? And God's love is so amazing and so great and so wonderful, he did not withhold that possibility from mankind. Okay? So bad things happen primarily because of Adam's sin. And then storms can make me better. Sometimes God lets storms come into our life, not because he's mad at us, because he wants to make us better. He wants to help us to improve. Hebrews 12, 5 to 7. So don't feel sorry for yourselves, or have you forgotten how good parents treat children, and that God regards you as his children. My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines, the child he embraces, he also corrects. God is educating you. That's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as dear children. This trouble you're in isn't punishment, it's training. Everybody say the word education. Education. That's what God's doing. He's educating us, making us better. Um, Hebrews 12.10 while we were children, our parents did what seemed best to them, but God is doing what is best for us, training us to live God's holy best. So why do bad things happen? Why do storms happen? Well, sometimes it's to make us better. Storms prove his love. You remember the story of Joseph? Um, how that he was one of the 12 sons of Israel, and his brother sold him into slavery, and he went to Potiphar's house, and then he got thrown into prison because Potiphar's wife, wife accused him of what he didn't do. And for 13 years, Joseph was 17 years old when this started. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been? 
taken from your family, put in a foreign land, not only in a foreign land, but in a foreign prison. And it seemed like that God had forgotten him. 13 years. But you know what God was doing? He was planning and preparing Joseph, literally, and I'm not overstating this, to save the world. You see, because he was able to interpret dreams and you know the story, the Pharaoh uh, had heard about that. Joseph goes before Pharaoh, tells him what his dream meant and warned him about the famine to come and Pharaoh promoted him to the second most powerful man in all of that kingdom, the empire. And God, you know why he let Joseph go through that? Because Joseph, Joseph would not have been able to save the world had he not gone through that. And unless Joseph was in that position at that time, many, probably millions of people would have died. So sometimes God does it to prove his love. Sometimes storms happen to increase my faith. These trials are only to test your faith. And your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. It will bring you much praise and honor on the day of his return. Why do storms happen? Well, sometimes they happen to help others. You see, God wants your experience to be something that will be a help to someone else. And then sometimes storms prepare you for difficulties that lie ahead. Aren't you glad? I don't know if you've watched any of the Olympics uh, last night I was watching uh, some of the swimmers and some of the runners and the track and field and just different things. I even watched a little bit of handball. Never watched that before. That was kind of a strange sport. Um, and anyway, I was watching this, and it became obvious to me that these athletes had survived a lot of pain. They made a commitment that no matter what, they were going to stick with it. And for many of them, it paid off. All of them, it paid off. They became Olympic, Olympic athletes, and some of them won the gold medal. But their difficulty, whenever they were running or training, I was watching this uh, Katie Ledecky, I believe is her name. She's won more uh, swimming medals than any American woman in history, and she's won, I think, four or five gold medals now. And her big event is the 800-meter freestyle swim. I don't know if you've watched that or not. But that means that she was swimming for over a half mile. Now, I don't know if you ever tried to swim that far or not. That's not easy. And it's especially not easy if you're trying to do it as fast as you can. And I watched her as she won the gold medal. And I watched her as she finished that race. Man, she was out of breath. And I thought to myself, that woman has trained unbelievably hard and incredibly long so that she could be where she was at that time. An Olympic champion, a record-breaking swimmer. You know what she did? She didn't give up. Whenever it became difficult, which I promise you, it got difficult. If you ever tried to swim that far, it's difficult. And this woman, uh, she just never gave up because you know why she trained? Because she knew it was going to be some hard times ahead. And she trained, and she got better. And then finally, storms help you overcome the fear in your life. Don't you imagine Job had a lot of fear? But fear does not get displaced by self-confidence but rather by God confidence. And the reason that Job was able to survive the storms of life was because he was confident, not in himself, not in his culture, not in his money or possessions, not even in his family, but his confidence was in God. And as a result, he was able to survive the storm. Let's pray at this time. Lord, we thank you for your love we thank you for how much you have blessed us and been with us. God, I pray that you just help us to follow you with all of our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do. Before we finish our prayer, I wonder if today, if you would say, Pastor, I need to receive Christ as my Savior. 
I'm not sure I'm a follower of Christ, but I'd like to be. Is anybody like that? Would you raise your hand? You need a prayer for that. I would encourage you today, if you would like to have prayer, come up front here to this uh, stand, and we'll have somebody to pray with you, with our prayer team, and they'll talk with you, and you can get that settled. But with our heads bowed, I wonder how many would say, Pastor, I've been through some storms lately. I've been through some difficulties lately, and I want you to pray that God will give me strength to trust Him. Would you raise your hand? A lot of hands. A lot of hands. Lord, I pray that you just bless everyone here that's going through a storm. Help us to know that you're sovereign, you're in control, and that you're always with us. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to go ahead and come. And at this time, if you'd like to give in the offering, uh, and we realize that most people don't give in the plates or the buckets because there are other more convenient ways, but this is a way you can give. Drop your Next Step card in there. You say, how else can I give? Well, you can go to stillwaters.online. You can give that way. Or you can text the number 84321, 84321, um, and you can give that way. Or you can sign up for the Church Center app, and you can give uh, through that app. That's the way Kim and I give most of the time. And uh, it's just a very convenient and easy way to give. All right. Well, we went a little longer than normal, but we got a lot accomplished today. And uh, let's give our people that got ordained today, let's give them a hand once more. So excited for them and so excited for our church about how they're serving God in this place. All right. Well, don't miss next week, next week. Um, we're going to talk about hearing God's voice in the storm. I'm going to talk about, from 1 Kings 19, uh, about Elijah. He got discouraged. In fact, he got so discouraged, he asked God to kill him. I don't know if you've ever been that low or not, but he was, and you do not want to miss how you can hear God's voice, how God speaks to you during difficult times. All right? Hope you'll bring somebody with you. I love you. Thank you for being here today. We'll see you next Sunday.